let the last few people come in. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the RSA. Uh, my name is Josie Warden, and I work as a researcher in the economy team here, and it's my great pleasure to be able to welcome today's guest, Dan Lyons. Um, just before we get started, please can I ask you to make sure that your mobile phones are switched to silent? Um, and a reminder that we're filming today and live streaming over the web, so welcome to any of you who are joining us online. The hashtag for today's event is RSA Work, if you'd like to get involved in the conversation on Twitter. So you might know that the RSA has a large programme on the future of work at the moment. We're really interested in the changing relationship between employers and workers, uh, the nature of economic security, and the impact that technology might have on our workplaces. So this is a really opportune time to hear Dan's insights uh, from his experiences. Dan is an author, journalist, and screenwriter. You might know his work from the, eight, the series Silicon Valley, um, from his time at Newsweek, or from his viral blog, The Secret Diary of, J of Steve Jobs. Um, in his second book, which he's going to talk to us about today, he looks at the dangers of adopting Silicon Valley work practices in the wider economy and considers what we can do to recoup some dignity and fairness in the workplace. After we've heard from Dan, I'll have a few questions for him before we open to questions from the floor, and there'll be plenty of time to hear from you as well before we wrap up at two. And I particularly encourage anyone who doesn't normally ask questions to please feel comfortable to do so today. So let's get started. Please join me in welcoming Dan Lyons. Hi, thank you. And thank you for that introduction, Josie, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I would like to start by just asking you a question, and you don't have to answer out loud. But if you think about where you work and the people you work with, um, how much do you think those individual human beings contribute to the success of the organization? Uh, or do you think they contribute to the success of the organization? Um, I am hoping, uh, or I'm assuming most of you think yes, they do. I think that they do. Um, however, three years ago, uh, Corn Ferry, which is a big uh, executive recruiting firm, uh, surveyed 800 CEOs and asked them to list the five most valuable assets in their organization, the five things that would m have the most impact on whether the company succeeded in the future. And humans didn't make the list. Right? Yeah. And you remember it was not long ago when it was a, at least a cliche that they would spout that said, our most valuable assets walk out the door every night, right? And now humans have become second class citizens in our own organizations. Um, I think that that view of, of the importance or relative unimportance of humans is really foolish on the part of CEOs. And I actually think it is a, uh, it's equivalent to people who fall asleep in their Teslas, believing that the Tesla can drive itself. And a Tesla cannot drive itself, but people keep insisting on believing that it can. Um, and this is not really how the internet was supposed to play out. So 20 years ago, almost to the day, the summer of 1999, the um, the founding editor of Wired magazine wrote an article in which he tried to predict the next 20 years, what, the next two decades, what were we going to experience? And the, the key word from his article was ultra-prosperity, that we were heading into a period where everyone was going to make tremendous amounts of money. The slug from his story was, the good news is you're going to be a millionaire soon. The bad news is so will everyone else. And work was going to be amazing. And we were going to have to work less to make our millions. We would have, by 2020, twice as much leisure time as we had in 1999. Now, I bring this up not just to make fun of the founding editor of Wired magazine, although I like to because he's always wrong and always in exactly the same way. But um, uh, also because I recall that period of uh, enthusiasm that we had for the internet in the late 1990s when the, uh, it, it seemed we had possibilities that we couldn't even imagine, right? And we thought that um, it would empower individuals. We thought it would strengthen democracy. It would actually foster the spread of democracy around the world. Um, it would make us into digital citizens. We'd be empowered and much better informed. 
and we would make really good decisions about things like our elected leaders. Yeah, you can laugh. So anyway, that's it. Uh, so that hasn't worked out, right? And a few years ago, I started wondering, where did we go wrong? We had this great plan, and somehow it went off the rails. And at the same time, I started weighing these two things that didn't make sense to me together. One is that we live in this age of miracles, uh, amazing new technologies that really do incredible things, and yet we're miserable. Uh, study after study of the workplace shows anxiety, stress, and depression all on the rise at alarming levels. Uh, engagement is stuck in a rut, uh, even though for 20 years HR people have been trying anything they can to make people feel more engaged with their work. And that didn't seem to make sense to me. And so I set out to write this book, which I ended up calling Lab Rats, to answer that question for myself, more or less to go on a journey and try to figure out how that happened. And that's how I ended up almost exactly two years ago today sitting in a, in a coffee shop in Menlo Park, California, which is the heart of Silicon Valley. It's right near Stanford. And I was meeting a woman who is going to show me how to play with Legos. And um, like this. And I didn't quite believe this was true, but this is now a corporate thing, right? This, is a th this woman makes a living going to big corporations and running workshops where everybody takes the day off, and you make things out of Legos, and then you talk about the things you made out of Legos. Um, it's basically like if you imagine those same people that you work with again, imagine going to group therapy with those people, <laughs> listening to their problems and having them listen to yours and then playing with toys, right? <laughs> so to me, I realize this is probably not the, the main reason people are miserable, but if you're writing a book about workplace misery, this seemed like a great place to start, right? <laughs> so, and, and I really wanted to not like this woman. I wanted her to be horrible because I also knew I wanted to make fun of her in my book. And, <laughs> but she turned out to be really lovely and really smart and earnest and really sincere. And it turns out that this Lego stuff is a huge industry in and of itself. There are thousands of people like this woman who have been certified to teach a methodology called Lego Serious Play. There's this sort of bogus ginned up brain science that sort of explains how it works using the frontal cortex and the limbic system, but none of it really is true. Um, <laughs> more than 100,000 people have participated in this nonsense, right, at work without having a choice to opt out, right? And Lego Serious Play, this is true, is so big that the field has had a schism. There are old believers and new believers who both hate each other, and one side thinks the other guys are selling, you know, uh, snake oil, we're the true guys, and the other one says the same about the others. And if you've seen Life of Brian, it's like the Judean People's Front and the People's Front of Judea, right? And they really hate each other. But Legos are just one thing that if you work in the new economy, you might find yourself having to do. You might find yourself having to do this, where this is a game called Six Thinking Hats, where there are six different crazy colored hats, and you all take turns wearing them and role playing based on the color of your hat. And, and the consultants all tell you how much people love this and how transformative it is, but look at those people. They do not look happy, right? I mean, just look at them. They look miserable, right? And at the end of the day, they rounded them up, they made them take a picture, and they're like, I can't believe I did this, right? <laughs> um, there's another game where you pass tennis balls around in this sort of fire brigade. Uh, there's another one, I don't even know what these guys are doing. You, you fight each other with a big ball, I think, is what you do. Um, there's this, massively multiplayer thumb wrestling. The ones on the right and the bottom right seem to be trying to reach their heads down through and then, you know. But uh, um, all of this, however, is part of a much larger religion which is called Agile, which you probably have heard of, because this religion has swept the corporate world in the last five or 10 years. Now, Agile really began as a one-page manifesto for how to write software faster. And it was written by 17 software gurus who met for one weekend in Utah at Snowbird, the ski area. And they just banged out this little list of principles, and it has morphed since then. 
into everything. It's like the blob, right? So they, they, it worked for writing software, it, and it still does. So then people thought, well, why don't we use it for everything? We could have agile lawyers, agile bloggers, agile marketing, agile sales, right? Then it morphed up another layer and became agile can do everything. Agile can actually transform the organization itself. Nobody who created Agile ever envisioned that, but there have now been 4,000 books written about Agile. Agile has a rival called the Lean Startup, which is, you notice they both have the circle kind of thing, because they both work in this thing where you chase your tail endlessly at work, right? <laughs> um, and the Lean Startup was created by a guy who wrote a book called The Lean Startup, and, and his claim to fame was after college, he and a few friends co-founded a startup, he left after a few years. The startup really never amounted to anything. And this guy said, you know, I should teach other people how to do this. And, <laughs> and, and that has morphed also into a way to transform entire organizations, not just startups, entire organizations. And the intellectual underpinning is the Toyota manufacturing process. So you took a methodology used to build cars, and now you used it as a way to rewire human beings. Right? There are a couple problems with Agile, right? One is that there is no Agile, right? Agile, there's a million Agiles. There are as many versions of Agile as there are practitioners. So I tracked down one of the guys who wrote the original manifesto, the one-page thing, and luckily enough, he's English, so he's a good guy, and, and he tells the truth. And I said, what do you make of all of this stuff, all of this Agile stuff? And his answer was, I'd say about 90% of it is bullshit, <laughs> right? The problem is nobody knows which 90%, right? That's a bad joke, but anyway. But uh, yeah, he said, we, no, none of it makes any sense at all. Nobody can make sense of this, right? The other problem with Agile is it doesn't work. Almost all Agile implementations fail, utterly fail, and then have to be mopped up. I found uh, an Agile consultant who had written an essay called Agile Ruined My Life, who said, this is destroying people's lives. Because it isn't just that you spend weeks or months learning this nonsense and then nothing changes. It's that people get fired or people quit because they can't stand the madness anymore, right? And also because companies use Agile as a way to get rid of older workers. They can't fire you for turning 50, but what they can do is invent this pile of nonsense and new way of working that you have to adapt to and then tell you, I'm sorry, you're not Agile enough, right? So IBM is putting 300,000 people through Agile training. Right? GE is putting 300,000 people through lean startup training, right? which, which is insanity. So the question then is, why are they doing it? Right? Why are they making people do this? Partly to get rid of them. IBM is using it as a way to push workers out, but mostly because they're terrified. In the course of reporting this book, I visited some big old companies, including Ford, and they are scared to death. They feel like they're facing this existential threat from technology, from Silicon Valley, and that they have to avoid disruption. And the only way to avoid disruption is to copy the disruptors. And they feel, or they've been sold this idea that because the internet exists, everything about how to run a company for the last 100 years no longer works. It no longer applies. Now, I don't know if people felt this way when television came out or radio or the telephone, but they do about the internet. There's this sort of magical thinking that everything has changed so profoundly that work itself has to change. But then if you ask them, well, then what does work, they don't know, right? And so we're in this age of experimentation where they try new things, see if it works, and if it doesn't, they'll try something else. And so essentially, the human beings inside these organizations are turned into lab rats, hence the name of my book. But they're, basically, we are participating in these massive experiments in behavioral uh, psychology, right? organizational behavior. And we are the lab rats. Um, and it's worse because it's inflicted on you by quacks. Right? Even the originators of the ideology are quacks. And then it's implemented by people who are three generations, three steps removed from the quacks. So there are people who do things like mix Agile and Lean. So Agile has a concept called scrums, where you work in little groups. Not a bad idea, but whatever. Uh, in Lean, they call it a Kanban. In the hybrid model, they call it a scrum ban. Now, if you can imagine going to work and every, it keeps changing, you know, eventually you're going to leave, right? Because it's nuts. Um, 
And then you think to yourself, well, okay, that's, uh, that's kind of a pain in the butt, but if you keep your job, fine. Uh, it's not the worst thing in the world. In fact, the worst things are things like money and loss of job security and dehumanization, which I, I'll talk about in a sec. But it turns out that change itself really, really overwhelms people's brains. And it does really bad things to people. Uh, and some of the best research, in fact, comes from uh, academics here in the UK. Uh, I won't go into it, but it, it's in my book. But at one point, my editor in New York, who's a very clever guy, said to me, you know what's cool, since we're calling the book Lab Rats, I wonder if there's some experiment or something you can find that actually used rats that then would apply to the book that we could use. And I thought it was a really good idea. You know, it was really clever. And I went out looking, and sure enough, there is. So this is the deal. So imagine this. When you think about new antidepressant drugs, right? So when a pharmaceutical company develops one, you know, you can't just test it out on humans and see, you know, what happens, right? So they try, they start them out on rats to see if they work. But then the question becomes, how do you make a rat depressed to see if the antidepressant works? And that sounds crazy or like the setup for a really bad joke, but it's actually a real thing. They had to figure out how to make rats depressed. And they actually came up with something. And this is it. Unpredictable chronic mild stress protocol. It's used all over the world. And it works like a charm, right? And all they do is make tiny changes in the rat's environment. So you tilt its cage a little bit. Or you change its bedding. You put in wet bedding or you put in shavings that have urine and feces from a different animal, from a different rat. Or you might change the cycle of night and day to throw it off. Or play sounds of a predator bird for 10 minutes and then stop. But you never do anything really bad to the rat. You don't starve it. You don't put its life in danger. You just make small changes. But they have to be unpredictable. They have to be chronic. And they have to be mild. And within days, the rats are like nuts, right? They, they stop grooming, their coats fall apart, they won't eat, they, uh, uh, they, they have anhedonia, they, with the uh, inability to experience pleasure. They won't run in their little wheels anymore. And then they can test the drug. And as I was reading about this, and then I called some academics or scientists who work with the rats and asked, you know, does this apply to humans and this and that, it struck me that everything they were doing sounded almost exactly like things I had just read in a book by the former head of HR at Netflix, who was describing them as good things about how they run things at Netflix. And she was saying, I'm writing this book because everybody wants a little bit of our Netflix mojo. And I was like, no, I don't want your Netflix mojo. I don't, I don't want it at all, right? Netflix has a really brutal culture. And they're really proud of it. That's the, the amazing thing is they sell it as this amazing way of dealing with workers. If you look them up on Glassdoor, however, their Glassdoor rating of you know, employee happiness is the same as Dow Chemical, which is pretty amazing. Um, so this is the problem with Agile and these other things, which is that a new metaphor is emerging inside corporations for the corporation itself, that the organization is a computer. And we are the chips in it. And the reason Agile fails is that you can't reprogram people like chips. The metaphor is essentially pump a software upgrade into the machine. The little chips all get reprogrammed, and boom, we become Agile. Right? Um, a, the software that they're pumping out isn't any good. And B, we can't be reprogrammed that way. This is Ray Dalio. He runs the world's most successful hedge fund. Um, and this is his advice to his managers, that think of yourself as a machine within a machine. And that's how you should think about managing people. He's actually trying to incorporate his management techniques into software and create an AI CEO who will then make decisions better than a human manager will make them. Uh, I don't know if he'll succeed, but his idea is we use AI to trade stocks. Why don't we use it to run companies? Um, this is the same guy from Wired who's wrong about everything. But yeah, in the future, you'll be paid based on how well you work with robots. So what's happened in this metaphor of the organization as machine is that the machine becomes the most important thing. The algorithm, the methodology, becomes the most important thing. And we plug into it. We become like meat puppets on the end of an algorithm. If you work in, in a, uh, an Amazon shipping center, you're essentially 
managed by machines, you're measured, you're monitored by machines, and now Amazon has figured out a way for the machine to fire you, just to keep track of your metrics and go, you're out. Meanwhile, the way we get hired is also being driven by machines. A company in Utah called HireVue has created AI that scans video. So if you're applying for a job, you first record an interview on video, no human looks at it, the AI scans it, and decides whether you should talk to a human or not. So if you want to get even through the next interview, you first have to impress the AI. There are now consultants being, uh, consultancies being created to teach people how to impress the AI, right? How to outsmart the AI so you get the job. Um, they also, in the course of evaluating whether you should get passed on, can do things like assess your IQ, uh, do a personality exam on you, and sort of get an idea of what makes you tick. And all of this is saved in servers in Utah. And I asked the CEO, I said, wait a minute, so you're building a giant psychometric database of real people attached to their names, their social security numbers, their phone numbers, their address, all of their actual information. And he's like, well, yeah, but we're really careful with it. I was like, look, <laughs> that doesn't really make me feel good. And if you go back for subsequent interviews, you can see where this goes. The, data, the, the, the database just gets richer and richer. Right? Um, a few years ago, this guy, Nick Hanauer, started warning fellow billionaires that this kind of dehumanization, this kind of tr way of treating people at work was going to lead to really bad outcomes. In fact, right now, this is interesting to me that, you know, in France, there's a trial going on now where the former CEO of France Telecom is on trial because 10 years ago they had a wave of suicides at France Telecom. And he's being held responsible for this, he and some other executives. And interestingly enough, the stuff they did to the workers at France Telecom was very much like what we have in the workplace today. So what they did was they couldn't fire people because of union rules and laws in France. So Didier Lombard said, OK, let's just make them miserable until they quit. And his line was, they'll leave one way or another, either out the door or out the window. And they took people who had been skilled, workers uh, with some degree of autonomy, so say imagine a satellite engineer, and they stuck them in call centers. They put them in, in headsets and they made them read a script all day long. And they monitored them constantly. How many calls did you make? Why didn't you make more calls? If you want to go to the bathroom, you have to ask. If you show up two minutes late, you get in trouble. They basically turned these guys, one worker said at a time, I'm being turned into a robot, right? I'm being made into a human robot. And it drove them to suicide. Well now, Ten years later, this is par for the course. If you work in a Netflix call center, an Amazon shipping center, or if you're an Uber driver, that is life. And I don't know if we've become more resilient in the past ten years than those workers were at France Telecom, if we've somehow internalized this and just accepted that this dehumanization is what work now involves. Hanauer is a rich guy who got even richer because a, while, a long time ago, in the first dot-com bubble, he met this little nerdy dude named Jeff Bezos who was looking to open a bookstore online. And he was the first investor in Amazon. But he has since become terrified about the soaring income inequality that we have, because of, partly because of the internet. And he wrote this great essay addressed to his fellow plutocrats in 2014 saying, the pitchforks are coming for us. Either we do something about income inequality and the way we're treating people, or this is going to come back on us. And then now, here are the pitchforks, right? Here they are. I mean, five years later, and it's not just Trump, but the, the thing that struck me as I was writing this book was I set out to write about goofy stuff, about playing with Legos at work and how it drives people crazy. And during the course of reporting and writing it, I realized that work isn't just work. And that when we talk about work, we're talking about society. We're talking about people's ability to save for the future, to put their kids through school. It's a lot more than just how things go at work. And it occurred to me that if we want to fix society, we need to start by fixing work. It's not going to happen. Trump, we might get rid of him, but we're still going to have these people. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes, and it's from 60 years ago, right? that the risk of the future is that we may become robots. And I feel a lot of people now are experiencing that day to day in their life. Even when you're doing the Lego thing, you're kind of being told, be a good robot. You know, play with the Legos. Don't complain. You need to keep this job. You need to fit into the agile machinery. 
So stay quiet and, and just do as you're told. And it's also, there's a power dynamic there too. Um, we can talk more about this in the Q&A, but thank you for your time and for hearing me out. Thanks very much. Perfect. Thank you very good. much. Thank you. So, I feel like I should um, admit that I have used Lego Serious Play oh, in a God. workshop, but they were with 12-year-olds. We should have talked about this before. I know we, we should have done. <laughs> yeah, they were 12, so I think it was okay. Um, I guess, actually, on that, it's, I'm interested to know whether you think that some of those practices and exercises are completely flawed in themselves, or if it's the way they're used and how they're used in companies that is so insidious. Um, I think the latter. And I will tell you that, in fact, uh, this is in the book, too, that, that when I sat down with the Lego Serious Play person, um, the first thing, I don't know if you, did you do the one called Make a Duck? No. There's a classic Lego Serious Play, apparently, um, game called Make a Duck, and you get six pieces, and uh, 30 seconds or a minute, just throw them on the table, make a duck, you have a minute, go. And I totally panicked, right? There's a crowded cafe, and I start thinking, this is some kind of test, this is a quiz, and I'm terrible, I've never been able to do a Rubik's Cube, I don't have spatial thing, one piece is clearly the head, it has two eyes, um, and I really, no, really panicked, like I really, really thought, this is an IQ test, and I'm going to be shown lacking, right? I'm not going to be able to figure, because I can't figure out how all six of them go together. I'm trying different things. I break it apart. Then I thought, no, it's not an IQ test. It's a Rorschach test. And however you make your duck is actually going to reveal something creepy about, like, you know, what a <laughs> sicko you are, right? You know, so I'm, then I'm thinking, so I'm really self-conscious, and I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail. And she kind of watches me, kind of like, hmm, interesting. You know, I'd make a choice, oh, interesting, you know? And finally, she kind of cleared her throat, and <clears throat> time's up, and I said, well, that's it. I, I only have, I can only do four, I'm sorry, you know, I can only pick four pieces. And she said, well, who said you had to use all six pieces? I never said that. I just said make a duck. Like, mm, like this smug <laughs> little school teacher is like, okay, I'm going to set you on fire now, right? You know? so, so then, um, but then I realized that in just that minute, like, she had gutted me like a fish. Like, mm. that was everything about how I approach work. I'm terrified I'm going to make a mistake. I don't know how to do this. I'm going to fail. I'm going to get fired. And I thought, wow, yeah, it, it, so it really was profound. I'm not sure I want to do it in front of my coworkers. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. But, um, and, and I think she was very good. I'm not sure that everybody doing this would be quite so good. The other one thing she said to me is, think of something you're struggling with and try to make that out of Legos. And I'm struggling with the fact that I can't believe people do this. You know, how do I make that? You know? <laughs> but, um, but, but yeah, it was, um, but it, no, there are elements of it that actually really work. I think even the, you know, the ball tossing stuff, it gets people talking, right? It gets, so. Yeah, it's kind of how it's used and what, what's really behind what they're trying to do with it. That's the, the difficult bit. I guess, yeah. Um, thinking in terms of this kind of security around work, it feels like we've had a relative period of economic security and work security mm. in the last century, half century. Mm. But that obviously hasn't always been the case. And I, a lot of the work I'm doing is around manufacturing and thinking about some of the parallels between industrial revolution and the way people were treated then to now there seems to be it's different situation but some parallels i'm wondering do you think there's an element about the sort of radical change in technology that brings this out in people and what could we maybe learn from how we've dealt with previous technological disruptions in work yeah i would really like to find out more about what you're doing because i i've sensed and heard the same thing then in a sense mm -hmm. what we're calling progress and innovation say in the last 20 years in silicon valley is not it's actually a return to work practices from a century ago and that are not really good and yeah. then going backwards and i think in some ways I, I also think that what happened is in around 2000 when the first dot-com bubble blew up and then we had the second boom uh silicon valley itself got sort of hijacked by a new kind of person mostly by venture capitalists who and a lot of money flowed in and it became a kind of casino and it became, people figured out a business model where you could make a company that never makes a profit, but you yourself can become wildly rich from that. And they have found a way to repeat that and repeat that and repeat that and crank that wheel. But part of that is that if that's the company you're building, you don't treat people well. You don't care about your employees. You don't want them to stay, right? You treat them as disposable widgets. So I think there's a sort of brutality that emerged in Silicon Valley, in a place that used to be the opposite, 
It used to be the kind of, you know, you had a hot tub and everybody, it was a cool place to work and Silicon Valley was a cushy, fun, nice place to be. And it became this kind of very ruthless place where, I'll tell you one story that struck me is that at Uber, this just went public, but a couple years ago, you know, a guy, a young engineer got a, a recruited by Uber from, I forget, LinkedIn or something. And within five months he had committed suicide and he, th he went in thinking, he had, you know, won the golden ticket. He was, he has all this equity in the Uber IPO. You're going to get rich. At that time, it was for Uber's trouble. So it was like the golden unicorn of Silicon Valley, and got in and found out that it's, it was a brutal environment. At the same time, in New York, taxi and livery drivers started killing themselves because they were their wages were getting depressed by the competition from Uber and Lyft. And one of them, you know, and they were, they were quite open about, one guy wrote a long thing about, I'm doing this because Uber and Lyft have destroyed my ability to make a living, I'm gonna lose my house, boom. And I thought, that's interesting. This company, Uber, sits in the middle of, boy, the engineers who you think have great jobs, the drivers over here, they have their own army of contract workers who are also deeply exploited, and a handful of people in the middle are gonna make enormous amounts of money. Um, so yeah, I think that business model caught hold and uh, it has been, it has dragged workers back to, yeah, what, what yeah. you had in the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. Maybe even less, at least in the Industrial Revolution, you'd, where I lived, I grew up in where the Industrial Revolution was in Massachusetts, in the textile mills. It was young kids coming in from the country, and at least lived in dorms. They, they had a place to, and food and stuff before they were exploited. But you know what I mean? There was, this is actually, in a way, kind of worse. Uh, I think, yeah, I think this is the line you said in the book around, it's a, these practices are kind of a bizarre blend of silliness and cruelty. Yeah. There's something really insidious about it, and I think you see that when you the examples. It's very a lot of it's very funny, but underneath it, there's this also this, this horrible darkness to it. Um, and maybe that it's in, it seems like an interesting blend. It's almost more like sort of playground bullies than that you, something you'd expect from kind of responsible adults. And I'm wondering, you saying about the, that culture in Silicon Valley? Do you think there's something that's caused that that particular culture to develop around that? area? Yeah, well, I think it is, it's greed. You know, if you can make money really, really, you can make a lot of money really fast. Um, and, um, but you had to sell it somehow. You had to have some employees, right? You couldn't really have no employees. So you could sell it by coming up with all this bread and circus stuff. You put a slide in the lobby and a ping pong table and beer kegs. In my last book, I, I was working at a startup that had never, it still has never made money. They've been public for years, and the stock keeps going up and up and up. And I, I asked one of the venture capitalists involved in the company, why do you let them spend all this money, all this crazy stuff, and they don't even make a profit? And he, his line was, a great line was, beer is cheap, right? We don't want to give them equity, you know? No, 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 we'll give them all the beer they want, right? Mm. They, you hire young kids, you burn them out, you work them, you know, beyond the limit for two or three years, and then you just keep replacing them. So they have very, very high turnover. Um, you know, it's a, in a way, you could argue that it's actually uh, very logical. That if you and I decided to start a company and we were just gonna try to basically run a Ponzi scheme and just, you're gonna raise as much money as we can in a few rounds of, of venture capital and then flog it off to the, in an IPO and get out of Dodge quick before it all blows up, it's exactly what we would do. I, I, I hope you and I wouldn't do it, but, right? You know, you know what I mean? But, but a lot of people will. Yeah. yeah, those incentives are there to kind of drive people with that behavior. Mm. I think you, you talked about the, um, the pitchforks. But there was a report mm. re uh, re released today in the UK talking about the widening inequality and how, how that's undermining democracy and the real kind of fear that actually that's really going to, um, yeah, undermine democracy and pull people even further apart. And a lot of that is based on this sense that people are working very hard, but they're not being justly rewarded for what they're putting in, yet some people are extracting huge amounts from, from the economy. Um, mm. You talked about the kind of ultra-prosperity that's actually, actually only really realized by a few people rather than everyone. Um, but towards the end of your book, you start talking about things that companies you've seen that are doing things that you think are good and are kind of challenging this new mm. model. Can you maybe talk a few about some of those examples? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't get to that, thanks, yeah. So along the way, as I was, writing all this and reporting this and hearing all these horror stories, I started discovering companies that had had the same uh, realization long before I did and were pushing back against it already. And, and their idea was we simply should just build the kind of companies we want to work for. And ironically, some of them were actually inside tech. 
There's one in Chicago called Basecamp that's, they're fantastic. And they do everything wrong. Like they've never raised venture capital. They'll never have an IPO. They charge money for their product. They make a huge profit. And the two founders split it every year, but they also give everybody who works there a lot of money and free vacations. And, and they just say, and they don't want to be big. They say we have 50 or 60 people. We're happy being that. And um, they don't use a lot of technology. This is a really interesting factor. I just spoke with the CEO uh, a few days ago. Uh, for example, they don't use Slack. You know, because the, the, it's so annoying. If you sit there when Slack is constantly popping up, you can't concentrate. So their idea is we want people to have eight good hours of work a day and then go home. And so they, they say no more than 40 hours a week for anybody. In the summer, only 32. Everybody takes Friday off. And if that means we slip a feature, eh, okay, we'll get it next year. Like, it's, it's not the end of the world. It's project management software. It's not, you know... You know, we're not saving lives here. So yeah. they have this amazing balance of, of this, and they are constantly getting in arguments with people in Silicon Valley who say they're nuts and they're crazy, or you'll never be Steve Jobs. And one guy said, I don't want to be Steve Jobs. <laughs> like, I don't care what he did. I don't want to live like that. So uh, there's a, another gig economy company in New York called Managed by Q that uh, ref refused to play around with venture capitalists. The VCs uh, have a policy. If you start a gig economy company, your workers have to be contract workers. No benefits, you know, no, no uh, health care, no retirement, just a, an hourly wage, and, which is terrible, right? So Q decided from the start, no, we're going to uh, we'll make everybody a W-2 employee. And it, it's basically, um, it's Uber for janitors. It's uh, basically cleaning crews for corporate offices. But everybody is an employee. Everybody has a 401k. And their idea is that employers will be happy, they'll do a better job, so they'll have better customer retention, they'll have better employee retention. And honestly, the guy who started the company is just kind of a do-gooder and thought, you know, if you want to make the world a better place, it's not about giving people cheap Uber rides, it's about taking care of the people who work here. You start with those people, make the world a better place for them. Um, and so, yeah, there, there, was, there were really a lot of uh, exciting and interesting things happening inside tech, but they're counter to the to the overall the overall swing. However, I think that that pendulum may have swung as far as it's going to go. You see even like the disenchantment with the Uber IPO and Lyft and Snap. There are companies in, in the last year or so who have gone public while losing lots of money and their stock has gone down after the IPO and stayed down. So I think maybe invest because it's all propped up by whether investors are willing to, to mm. buy this, right? So that's yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting seeing where that's kind of driven from in a company, if it's the kind of uh, founders who just have that particular fo you know, emphasis on their values, they want to do this, mm -hmm. um, and how they see it through. But obviously, the investment community has a huge responsibility in the, in in that and helping that kind of develop. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about diversity when I was reading your book. It feels like th that that particular cultures that you talk about mm -hmm. are seem very excluding to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you were talking examples there about where it's been used purposefully to kind of exclude particular people. Um, have you seen any practices or examples of um, maybe good and bad where diversity, in, including women or ethnic minorities, um, have been done well or where it's been kind of actually very excluding for different groups? Uh, oddly enough, the, the same companies that I mentioned that are doing other things well are also doing diversity well. And they, yeah. honestly, it's again, uh, to your point, it starts with the CEO. If it doesn't start with the CEO, then it doesn't happen. And, um, and yeah, I, I, those, those companies are trying to do all of those things uh, and, and handle diversity right. And, and I think you have to start from the beginning. It has to be something you think about and are conscious of in the beginning. It's too late to get to the point where you have 1,000 or 10,000 employees and you, have this, uh, you look up and realize you have this monoculture and then go, oh, we should do a diversity initiative and, um, and sort of throw a little money at it. You know, it's too late then mm -hmm. um, and it is a huge, huge, huge problem in Silicon Valley it is it is really unthinkable. It's inexcusable. So, um, especially, I would say, with people of color. Um, older workers, they don't even lie anymore. They don't even pretend that they want to do better. They at least lie when it comes to women and people of color. But I don't know if you saw this movie, um, Hidden Figures, mm -hmm. about these women mathematicians who worked in a, a, a lab, a NASA lab in, in the segregated South in Virginia, you know, 50, 60 years ago. And um, there were three of them and they had to overcome 
racism was a male-dominated field and a white-dominated field. Um, I interviewed a young African-American software engineer who told me about the various internships and jobs she'd had where she was more isolated than those women, you know, in Silicon Valley, working in big, big, big companies. Uh, it's actually worse than the segregated South you know, half century ago. It's, it's amazing. So um, there's, there's kind of no excuse. It's, it's, a, it, it's really, really a bad situation there. Yeah. You kind of wonder why, in so many ways, why we laud those companies so much and are so, yeah. so kind of uh, desiring to, to emulate them or to, to be like that. But it feels like it's infiltrated so many, so many parts of the society. Um, okay, I think let's open up for questions okay. from the audience. So if you could please raise your hand, and I'm going to take two mm. at a time. Um, oh, really? And okay. there's a microphone roving. So mm. I'll go firstly um, with Charlotte, who's got one from Twitter here at the front. Uh. Oh, oh, you're taking questions on Twitter? Yeah. I am indeed, yes. Oh, right. <laughs> She's not right. doing her work. <laughs> <laughs> so our question from Twitter is from someone called Desert Rose. And the question is, um, how the current trend of dehumanizing work environments will impact social development. Okay. okay. And was there a second one <coughs> on this side? Oh. Yeah. No. No way. <laughs> no. No way. No, this Hi. My name's Sarah Horner from the Learning Work Institute. I'm actually at a conference around the corner. I've snuck away for an hour. <laughs> um, and it's full of people like Facebook and LinkedIn and it's a, a conference about inc increasing diversity. And the buzzword of the day, and I'm kind of encouraged and alarmed at, at the same time, is human skills, which um, somebody from LinkedIn spoke about. And everyone's like going, human skills, yes, that's the thing. And I'm... <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I've got to get away from here and go see Dan Lyons. Um, get my human skills. Yeah. They're, they're trying to get stuff. And, and I, so I'm wondering... Is this genuine, or is or that, or are they rebranding their practice? Wow. Okay. So which yeah. which one do? You... Do you want to do the second one first? Yeah. And okay. I'll remind you of the first one. Um, so in the case of Facebook, I don't believe a word Facebook ever <laughs> says about anything. I'll be honest. I, and I've covered them on and off for a long time since they were a very small company, and they have always been utterly dishonest and disingenuous about everything I've ever spoken to them about. <laughs> everything. So I don't buy for a second that they really care about diversity. I'll tell you, when they, when they were really afraid that Google was going to have a social network, Google Plus, and they found out about it in advance, boy, you know, they swung into action. And Mark Zuckerberg called everybody together and said, you know, uh, there's a great line from Carthago de Lenda Est, you know, from we're going to destroy Carthage. And, and they decided Google was Carthage. And boy, they did. They laid waste to Google+, Plus, right? And they all operated on it. So I don't buy for a second when he says, we would really like to hire people. We just can't find them. We don't know where they are. We're looking around. There's no pipeline. They do these two arguments. One is there are no STEM grads. You know, People of color aren't studying STEM, which is bullshit, right? Absolute bullshit. And two, 80% of your jobs are not STEM. Right, eighty percent of the jobs inside Facebook or anywhere else are marketing, sales, you know, customer service. They have nothing to do with STEM. I worked in a tech company. I don't have any STEM background. I don't know how to write code. It's absolute bullshit. Then I called up Spelman College, which is a, a there's a set of colleges in the United States called Historically Black Colleges and Universities (HBCUs). They're amazing institutions, right? And Spelman is one of the best, and it's all women. And I call up and ask, can I speak to the head of the CS department about how come your grads don't go to Silicon Valley? And they said, yes, you can. And you can talk to our president, Mary Campbell. I was like, oh, shit. And this woman was on fire. Right? Not angry, but she was just like, here's why it's a huge problem. We have 100% placement. But you know where they go? They go to Boeing. They go to all these companies on the East Coast. They're in huge demand. They don't want to go out to Silicon Valley and be the one black woman sitting in the room. Like, no, they don't want to go there. And Facebook, you know, isn't even, even, even reaching out anyway. You know, no, Facebook is utterly full of shit, okay? And they all are. They're utterly I'm full of shit. That. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'll tell you, well, I'm not going to rant about it, but uh, um, I stumbled into this because I was an old white guy. Right? 
and I'm working in a company, and I looked around, and I realized there's no one else here. There's one guy my age, and we became like besties, and we had to hang out all the time, and then we had to break <laughs> up because, you know, it was weird. But um, <laughs> uh, we had our first hands, uh, all, all hands meeting, 500 people in a room, and I looked around, and not only were they all like 25, they were all white, and not even all white, they were all the same kind of white. Like, I'm white, you know? <laughs> but I know, it was like a tiny, narrow slice of the Caucasian population, right? You know, it was like, there was no even Caucasian diversity. And then, <laughs> um, and then I realized that they all go hand in hand, that my situation and uh, people of color and women, because there were a lot of women, but they only went this high in the organization. You know, they didn't run anything. And, and it was a real epiphany for me, and I called one of my oldest friends I grew up with is a black woman my age. And, I, and I'm telling her, Marcy, this is crazy. You know, everything I say, they think I'm an idiot just because I'm like 50 years old and do you know how to use Facebook? Do you know how to do this? And she's like, welcome to my whole effing life, right? Like, dude, <laughs> I'm a black woman. Do you know what this is like? My whole life has been that, but welcome to it, idiot, you know? Um, <laughs> so it was, it was, no, but it was really a powerful epiphany. Um, and every year they put out reports. Every year, for years, Apple, Facebook, Google, their diversity reports, and they take a little victory lap for doing a diversity report. But every year it says the same thing. Not much progress. We're doing our best. We're trying to look, you know? I mean, it's horrible. Like, less than 1% of these companies are people of color. It's insane. Anyway, I'm sorry, the first question was about dehumanization. Yeah, how would dehumanizing affect social development? Broadly, I suppose. Yeah, I, I think it's, 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 it's terrible. Like, the fact that not a bad, this is a terrible way to say it. I mean, what happens to people in Amazon shipping centers I think is, is incredibly inhumane and sick and totally needless. Think about it, Amazon is run by the richest guy in the world. He's worth $150 billion. You would think if you got a job in an Amazon shipping warehouse, you'd be like, oh my God, you know, I have died. It would be like getting a job on the line at Ford or GM a, a generation ago, we're like, you're made. You know, you might have a high school education, but you're gonna work on the line, you're gonna have a second home, you're gonna have a boat, you're gonna have a really good life, your kids are gonna go to college. It was a good job. There's no reason why Amazon can't pay those people huge amounts of money. You know, the same with all of these companies, and yet they don't. I, I still can't fathom it. I don't understand why they don't. Facebook, not to get back to Facebook, but anyway. There's a story, what? Oh, well, okay then, they're great. So, uh, no, I mean, no, no, these guys, I mean, it's, it's, that's the thing, it's like so needless. Amazon was faced with a tax to help homeless people because Amazon has created huge problems inside Seattle and so have other companies. But the tax was gonna be on a per employee basis uh, to help, and the money raised was gonna help alleviate homelessness in, in Seattle. And for Amazon, the bill was gonna be like $12 million, like really nothing. And they fought it tooth and nail. They threatened to leave Seattle, like how dare you? We're not gonna pay that tax. Um, it is insane. It is like shareholder capitalism run rampant, just on steroids. You know what the biggest problem in San Francisco right now is? People defecating in the streets, right? A few years ago, they had 5,000 reported incidents, right? Last year, there were 28,000 incidents. The only upside of this is that all these tech bros have to walk and ride through it to get to work, <laughs> which is great. But they now, instead of, how would you fix that? When you build toilets, right, or housing. No, 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 we're going to create something called the Poop Patrol. And these guys ride around in San Francisco in hazmat suits, and you can call in a turd. You saw one, like, I call one on. A guy, I swear to God, a guy created an app called Snap Crap. You take a picture. <laughs> this is true. You take a picture of the offending turd, right, and it, it's geotagged, and it goes to the department, and they can, Rrr! they got a 2.11 in progress. They get there, you know, number two in progress. Right? They get there before it's coming out. No, And they, and they, they it's like, are you kidding me? This is your way of solving the problem? I mean, they're sitting on enormous amounts of money, and yet this is how they think about fixing things. So, um, sorry, go ahead. I, I rant too much, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> right. Let's but Snapchat, I had to work in Snapchat yeah, because it's so, so good. Yeah. Okay, the gentleman here at the front. This is going to be a success as a book and as a series of talks and everything else. And I wonder for your second edition, if you can incorporate something about an idea conference that happened in a little place called Billund in Denmark. That's the home of Lego. <laughs> and I think that as much as I enjoy the chat, you should learn a bit about the Lego idea conference because it is not just a gizmo, 
There is a methodology behind that, and I think that you disrespected that in a way that is not fair. The rest of the thing, I agree 100% with what you said. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I apologize to, to Lego. No, you're probably right, and I probably am too glib about it. I would agree. I'm probably too glib about it. I look at it from the outside. We really need to attend. It's a big day conference. <laughs> the best creativity in the world. And that company represents the value that you expect, expect everybody else to have. Ironically, right. Lego is a, a really well-run company for years and years and years. So I, I, I no, I, I take your point. It was a cheap shot. I agree. <laughs> okay, this one. But it's you know, but it is funny, right? I mean, <laughs> they, they, you know, I'm, it's a yeah. So I'm going to keep it in, but you know, thank you. No, no, I'm sorry. No, you're right. And, and in fact, the fact that you used it made me think I was probably being no, I probably was being a jerk about that. Laura Trendle Morrison, The Game Changer Consultancy. I'd like to ask a question. It was really interesting. You mentioned France Telecom because I was working in industrial relations at the time in the technology industry. Now, um, my question is what we've seen is less and less union representation in organisations. Mm. Actually, organisations going very anti-union to the point where the workers won't join. What do we need to do to get people to re-engage with the fact of what's happening to jobs and to get them to push governments to legislate against some of the negative practices? Because it does feel a little bit like a second industrial revolution here. Yeah. No, I, I, in fact, I saw you nodding when I mentioned France Telecom, I think. Um, it's, I have a slide I use sometimes where you show an old... Uh, a sewing factory in New York from 100 years ago, and it's women lined up at these desks with a, with a sewing machine, and it looks exactly like a startup. They're the same buildings now, those old brick buildings, only everybody has a laptop, right? <laughs> so you're creating these digital sweatshops, right, that, that exist. I think uh, unionization is a huge problem and the decline of unions, and I do think, though, there, there's some movement that's hopeful. So 20,000 people at Google walked out a while ago, it was, and it was about something else. It was about the, a, a big payment made to an executive who had sexually harassed women. But um, there was a sense, anyway, that Googlers could be motivated for things they cared about to get together, and they realized their power. And I think the same has happened at Amazon and at Microsoft. They kind of are starting to realize that they do have power inside the organization. And, but right now they're using it to steer sort of policy, like don't do business with the Department of Defense, things like that. But you could imagine it being um, turned toward worker treatment. However, at, at one of my book events in San Francisco, I asked, there was a Googler there who I know, and another issue at Google is that there is a, a two-class system, right? There are Google employees and there are Google contractors. And they literally wear different badges so you can tell who's who. And for the first time ever, more than half of Google is now contract workers rather than employees. And I said to this guy who is an employee, well, do you think you guys would go and lock arms to help the contractors? And he, no. And he said, you know, most of us don't know if we'll have a job next year. I don't know if I'll have a job at Google, you know? Um, so there's still resistance to it. We have also in the last uh, congressional election elected a, a, a new group of young Democratic uh, Congress people, mostly Congress women, who are really attacking the idea of work, really going after that idea of work, because it is such an important issue, and it's been sort of glossed over for a long time. So I've been heartened by, by that, too, that uh, we could try to get more awareness of that, but I don't know. Um, Thank you, I'll take some from over here. Um, just the gentleman here on the end, and then the lady behind you at the back, please. Hello, Martin. Hi, thank you. Um, it's been nagging me since the beginning of your, um, your slideshow. Uh, you showed us all these uh, crazy examples, the Lego and the hats. Uh -oh. The multi-person thumb wrestling. <laughs> is that real or is that a test of audience gullibility? You're saying, you know, um, are, we, are we meant to believe that or it, it, is it real? Um, <laughs> Um, That's a pretty short answer. It's real. Yeah. It, it is. Oh, yeah. oh dear. Oh dear. But, but, but the question, my, my question more seriously is, were all the examples you looked at in America, did you consider, uh, I mean, you mentioned France Telecom, but are there similar things going on that you're aware of in, in Europe, in this country, and especially in China? I mean, huge economy, hugely growing economy. Are there examples uh, that you found there, or is that outside the scope of, of what you're doing? Yeah, I didn't really look in Asia. I, I did, 
write about one story that's from the UK that I found, you probably all know this, but the, because it went really viral, a guy in Scotland uh, saw uh, uh, Amazon workers uh, sleeping in tents near the Amazon shipping facility in, in Scotland and found out it was because uh, one guy they talked to lived just far enough away that there was a bus you could take, but Jeff Bezos charged you to ride the bus both ways, and so the amount you had to pay for the bus would eat up two hours of his you know, wage. So he just decided to sleep in a tent during the Christmas rush and make as much money as he could and go back. So it was really cold. So that was one that I think prompted a big uproar in England. And I was sort of, I think you guys are ahead of the curve, not you guys, but I mean, in Europe, especially in the UK and then in the EU, there's more uh, a sense of challenging these companies about their work practices and their, than there is in the States. But I, I, it didn't go much beyond that. And I don't, I mean, China, I think, is, you know, I, I didn't write about it at all. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Um. Thank you. I'd like to know what you think about things like the relentless emphasis on um, the the positive thing, being positive all the time, the neuroscience of happiness, biohacking, psychedelic yeah. use, all of that kind of stuff that's happening in Silicon Valley. We were talking about that beforehand. Yeah. I was saying that, you know, I think I made a huge mistake putting the word miserable in the title of the book, you know. You, you know, especially in America, that people want books like Why Winners Win and How to Be a Badass and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it really is a big bestseller, How to Be a Badass. and. Uh, Damn it, I missed that one. So yeah, being, uh, yeah, I don't know, it drives me crazy because I think I'm dyspeptic by nature. And when I was at this startup at one point, at some point I said in a meeting, like, God, you guys are just all so happy and I just can't stand it. This woman was like, would you, would you rather we were all miserable? I was like, yes, that's where I've done my whole life. I've been a journalist. I'm, everybody I know is miserable. Yeah, we're, we're you know, yes. And, uh, or at least be realistic. But yeah, um, and the microdosing is amazing to me. I actually want to try it. Um, Apparently, Elon Musk does it a lot, but I think he macrodoses and then goes on Twitter. I don't think he's just microdosing, but apparently, I read about it recently that you're laughing, but it's true, like, yeah, you can take a tiny, tiny bit of LSD and you don't really get high, but you just really get through your day. And, um, That's where I'm going wrong. <laughs> see, exactly, me too. And, but no, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I think a lot of it is trying to put a big smiley face on what is underneath the surface a really brutal set of practices. Almost like, you know, the ping pong and the beer and all that stuff and the cheery slogans is a big distraction over here. So you don't realize that, you know, job security is going away, 401k, benefits, la 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 la, blah, 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 go play ping pong, you know. <laughs> so I think some of it is, is, a, is a bait and switch or, a, you know, it's a magician's trick. You know, you're, you're d distracting over here. So, I don't know. I think that cultural thing's really interesting. So we was, I, when he's, you were talking earlier about the book title, I was like, but people would love that. I think in the UK, people love it, because we have a, we're more skeptical, maybe, of that. Yeah, and miserable doesn't mean, you know, I don't think it's as yeah. bad. I mean, just, you know, I yeah. You're just a skeptical of something always being perfect. <laughs> um, okay, a couple more questions, please, before we finish. Um, so the gentleman here on the end, oh. and then just to be... Awkward for the microphone. I'll go for the lady over at the far end, please. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I heard somewhere that you, it takes you 12 days to count sequentially from one to a million, but to count to a billion, it takes you 31 years. And the reason I say that is because I wondered whether you thought the problem was really scale, that the companies that you mentioned that seem to be happy, seem to be happy at a certain scale, and the companies that you mentioned that made people miserable were big and that they were pushing for market dominance and growth and scale. And maybe they're just too big to care. That's a, a really good point, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I think you're right to some extent, right? The, the smaller companies do seem to be able to remain happy. Uh, although uh, I, I, I did an analysis where I looked at companies that make the, there's this fortune list called the best places to work and there are I don't know, a dozen or so companies that have been on it for 20 years. And they also tend not to be tech companies. They, they tended to be like supermarkets and hotel chains where people are very, very important to the experience. And so the, I think management makes an effort to be good to the, the humans because it's a very human-centric organization. But yeah, I think size is, is certainly an issue. And, and the other issue is growth. So, uh, Silicon Valley has become obsessed 
with rapid, rapid growth. It doesn't matter how much money you lose, but you just have to be growing at a really, really rapid rate. And I think that in itself is really taxing to the, the people inside the organization uh, for, for a variety of reasons. So, yeah, that's a very good point. Thanks. Um, Can I have a final one? Uh, it sound like a naive question, but given that the business model of these huge global organizations is basically not to make money, and therefore the corollary is they don't pay taxes, particularly in the environments where they m may have some of their um, biggest markets. And therefore, they're a large company, you know, presumably taking business from existing, existing companies who may have otherwise paid taxes into, into, into the kind of um, national pot. And they treat their employees in a way in which, in your words, they're spit out, you know, they're burnt out and spit out. Therefore, you know, they may end up having to access many more government services, et cetera, and they have insecurity of earnings. Why doesn't, why don't political parties or governments want to do anything about this? I find this, I, I suppose this thing that I think is, we've obviously had parliamentary um, proceedings to look at why some of these organizations don't pay tax, but it doesn't seem to change anything, and governments across the world must be experiencing this, and a reduction in the monies that come into their coffers. But it seems like it doesn't seem to make any difference as to what support they get as organizations to set up. I just, I just wondered why. It seems non-logical to me. Yeah, it, it is non-logical, right? I, I, I think, uh, I don't know, you know, the short answer is I don't know why it's tolerated. But um, I do think something you, you mentioned is, is really worth noting, that, that these companies, uh, say like Uber, that operate at a huge loss for a long time are essentially dumping. They're essentially taking a service and selling it below the cost it takes to create the service in order to destroy incumbents, and then ultimately, supposedly, to you know achieve a monopoly and then uh, extract money. But along the way, for now, all they're doing really is destroying value or more than they're creating, except for a very small number of people. So, it's a it's a it's a very dangerous situation where and it's funded by venture capitalists, some of whom have. Now, lots and lots of money. Look at SoftBank is raising hundreds of billions of dollars to throw at these things. So you can subsidize this stuff for a long, long, long time and destroy industries. Uh, I always felt it was unfair for Ford to have to compete against Tesla. Tesla can lose money forever and ever. And how, how do you compete with that? Oh, imagine being a, a division head at Ford and going, okay, we've got a great idea and we're going to do this thing and it's going to, well, We'll lose a billion or two a year for the next 20 years, and you know, but the stop right there, right? And you can't do that. So it's sort of an unfair advantage. The other issue on taxation that it really irks me more than that, than the money loser ones, is the companies that make tremendous amounts of money. So for example, Apple, which has found incredibly ingenious ways to dodge taxes for a long, long time by parking the money offshore, um, and now is sitting on $250 billion in cash that it doesn't know what to do with mostly because of tax avoidance. And we still love Apple, we love our Apple products, and they're hailed as this great American success story, but they don't pay their taxes. And they will come back and say, well, we pay what we owe, but you know, they've found ways to uh, work around that, right? Um, I, I feel like if I were a, a congressperson in the United States, I would be banging the table on that, that like you guys need to step up and pay your fair share in order to fund uh, a civil society, right? So, anyway, right, what, what's that? Start with the president. <laughs> yeah, right, right, exactly, no. Well, what I think it? before we get into that discussion, I'm afraid yeah. I'm gonna have to draw it to a close. Um, I'm sorry if you didn't get to ask your questions, but um, Dan will be in the foyer, I think, with, with some books, and I do encourage you to get a copy. Um, I think it does an amazing job of sort of shining that light on the, these behaviors which can seem very frivolous and funny, but actually are hiding something that's much darker and much more uh, destructive for society. So thank you very much for joining me today and please, please join me in thanking Dan. Thank